1914. Psalms 1914. Lord, you have given 
your life for ours. Lord, not just to uh, save us from a devil's hell, but Lord, to change us and to mold us and to make us more like you. Lord, we just pray that you forgive us where we fail you. Lord, help us to work together. Lord, as one body and one mind and one accord, striving together for the furtherance of the faith of the gospel. And Lord, for your honor and your glory, forgive us where we fail you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So he says, we commend not ourselves again unto you. Uh, at one point he says, do I need a commendation? Or do I need a letter of commendation? Uh, we don't need that, amen. We don't... <laughs> We all know who we are in Christ Jesus, amen. We're saved sinners, amen. We're sinners saved by grace, praise the Lord. But he says, we give you occasion to glory on our behalf, that ye may have somewhat to answer them which glory in appearance and not in heart. Uh, many people, and Dad was talking about, and Brother Damon and his devotion a little bit, and Dad and his Sunday school talking about religion, and how they've changed things and, and they've taken the physical applications and, and yet they don't do any of the spiritual applications. And uh, they've taken the context of God word, God's Word and changed it into a pretext. And so it's not really uh, what God intended it to be, but what they intended it to be uh, for their own gain, for their own justification. They justify themselves uh, in taking the word out of context and uh, doing that which is not intended to be. But the Bible says that we are not of those who corrupt the word of God, but out of sincerity, uh, you know, out of truth and sincerity, speak we in Christ. And uh, that we do not glory in appearance and the appearance of things, but we glory in the heart. Uh, that which is not seen. Uh, that which is uh, done by the Holy Ghost on the inside, that He has changed our hearts, He has made us new creatures in Christ Jesus. In verse 17, we won't read that, but uh, that's the verse there in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, that uh, God is doing a work in us and through us, and uh, that is to His honor and His glory, not our honor and our glory, but to His honor and His glory, because He's the one that changed us. If He had not changed us, if He had not given us a new heart, if He had not put His Spirit within us, uh, we would still be on that road uh, towards destruction. We would still be stuck in the miry clay. Uh, but praise God, He took us up out of that clay and He set us on the rock, which is Jesus Christ, on that firm foundation that we have. And so he says in verse 13, So for whether we be beside ourselves, it is to God. Or whether we be sober, it is for your cause. You know, whether people think we're nuts or whether they think we're in our right minds, it, it, it doesn't matter. Uh, it's all for the cause of Christ. For the furtherance of the faith of the gospel. Some people do think we're crazy, but that's okay. Uh, some people think that we're uh, people who have to have faith or believe in such things uh, that we believe in in the Word of God uh, should be, you know, admitted into a, 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 a psychiatric ward. But that's okay. They can go ahead and think what they want to, whether we're beside ourselves or whether we're sober. It is for the cause of those who will believe the Gospel to stand and give an account and to preach just as he said in verse 11, that knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. And so it is for their cause that we understand the truth of the Word of God, that we stand upon the truth of the Word of God, and that we live out the truth of the Word of God in our lives Amen. to be a living testimony of Jesus Christ. And then verse 14, we come to what we're talking about tonight. Why? Why do we do that? Why is it okay to seem crazy to, the, to some people in the world? Why is it okay, you know? Uh, a lot of people tell you, you know, you want to be like everyone else, right? You, 
You don't want to stick out. You want, you want to be, you know, I mean, that's the world's view is to, to go with the flow, right? Don't stand out. Go with the flow. Be like everyone else. You know, that's one of the dangers of, of public school, you know, going to public school, is they make you feel like you have to be like everyone else or you're not good enough. And there's different classes uh, within the school. You have the popular kids. You have the nerdy kids. You, and then you have the poor kids. And, and, and so it makes you feel like you're not worth anything because you're different and that you must you know, conform to what everyone else does. Dress like everyone else dressed. Talk like everyone else talks. But that's not what we are in Jesus Christ to conform to the world. Right. We are to be different. As I preached this morning, the Bible says we are a peculiar people. Right. We are to be a peculiar people. Not just to fit in, but to stand out. Amen. Not just in the, the uh, <laughs> spirit of, of being objective or, or, or uh, being uh, an adversarial, but in the sense of standing for something. Standing for truth, standing for Jesus Christ, we are to stand out and be a witness, a light in the world. And why would we do this? Paul said in uh, chapter 15, he said, why then would we uh, set ourselves at risk? He had been through so many things in his life, he said, why would we put ourselves at risk? of even being torn apart by beasts. Because they used to put take Christians and put them in the Colosseum and, and, let, and let the lions and bears come out and tear, tear them apart. That was part of their entertainment. Uh, so, why would we put ourselves at risk? Well, you say, well, we're not much risk in this country. And praise the Lord for that, that it hasn't come to violence yet in this country. But there's many countries that it has come to violence that if you're going to stand for Jesus Christ uh, and even follow Jesus Christ in, in the first thing that Christians, uh, a believer, follows Jesus in is baptism. Many people, if they follow the Lord in baptism after believing and accepting Him as their Savior, uh, they're chastised by their family and, and kicked out and, and uh, uh, excommunicated. And at length, are, are some are even beaten and, and some beaten to death because they want to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. So why would we hazard ourselves? Why would we put ourselves in such a state that the world looks down upon us? That people look at us as being crazy or, or uh, you know, uh, being a lunatic. They even told Paul, when Paul was preaching, uh, I, I can't remember if it was to Felix or, or uh, the Sanhedrin, but uh, as he was preaching, they said, man, you're out of your mind. You've lost your mind. <laughs> and he said, no, I'm in my right mind. Uh, you know, so people look at that and they think, you're, you're crazy. And you know what? It's getting worse and worse. Uh, you know, they said, I heard a, uh, someone say, uh, on the radio not too long ago that atheism is on the rise uh, big time and uh, it's it's gaining more and more and more but that's what our society has put out is a younger generation that they have no teaching at all on creation <laughs> there being a creator uh, and so uh, Christianity uh, or anything in religion really seems to be uh, silly and it's all about uh, science and it's about materialism and all these different things that the world teaches is okay and so we're really starting to be seen more and more as fringe <laughs> as being way out there uh, crazy the the Closer and closer we get to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we know what the Bible says, that there's uh, going to be more and more persecution. Uh, you know, the enemies will be the people of your household, 
mothers turning in daughters, daughters turning in mothers, fathers against sons, sons against fathers. I mean, it, it's going to get crazy. But yet, verse 14 tells us everything that we need to know. He says, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. Amen. I was dead. Yep. But now I'm alive. Amen? Amen. <laughs> to me, there is no other way to live. And once you have been born again, once you have been brought to life in Jesus Christ, how could you go back to those beggar, beg, beggarly elements? <laughs> how could you go back to the rudiments of the world, the ideology of the world? How could you go back to living that way when you have been quickened in your spirit, when you have been made alive? And that you understand that Jesus Christ died for you. That love that He had for you and the more that you know about Him and the more you know about yourself, the more you understand that you did not deserve any of it. Yeah. There is not one thing that He has done for us that we have deserved and ever will deserve. Yet He loved us and He gave Himself for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. In verse 21 He says, for He hath made Him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him, the just for the unjust. He gave Himself. He, without sin, died for us because of His love for us. And so knowing the love that Christ has for us constrains us that we're not worried about what the world thinks. We're not worried about what other people view us as. But we understand that this is the life. <laughs> Amen? He, Jesus is the life. Jesus Amen. is the resurrection. And that giving our lives for His sake, no matter how we're viewed in the world, and no, how, no matter how it hazards our life to do so, that that's the only path that is worth taking. Look at Romans chapter 2. One verse of Scripture says that they think it strange when you run not with them to the same ex excess. I mean, you're just weird if you don't want to do what they do, you know? If you don't want to go out and party and, and get drunk and, and do drugs and, and, you know, sleep around and all the different things that people think is normal and having fun, if you don't do those things, well, you're a weirdo. There's something wrong with you. But they don't understand that there's something right with us. <laughs> Amen. And it's Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 2 and verse 1 and 2, he says, Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judges. We're all inexcusable. Amen? <laughs> There's not one of us that is worth the salvation of God, that has earned the salvation of God. He says, For when, wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself, for thou that judgest doest the same thing. We're all the same. We're all sinners. He says, But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. God's judgment is just. That's the thing about it. The world doesn't think that way. They think, How could God judge us? How could God create us this way and then judge us for being this way? But God didn't create us this way. Amen. It's man who brought sin into the world and then death by sin. And so then death passed upon all men. Why? For all have sinned. We're the ones that have corrupted what God created as pure. Yeah. There's not one person that is inexcusable, that is justified before God of their, of their own selves alone. 
We were all dead. And we were all justly condemned. But praise the Lord there. <laughs> now there is no for. Uh, let's see. I know that verse of scripture. Yes. There's no more condemnation. No, that's, yes. Chapter 8. Verse 1. He says there is therefore now no condemnation. That's a tongue uh, twister. That's why I couldn't get it out. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. Praise God that yeah, we were condemned because of our sin and, our, and because of our unbelief. But now in Christ Jesus we are not under condemnation anymore. Because why? Because Jesus Christ paid the cost. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2. First Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14, he says, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually undiscerned. How were we dead? We were dead spiritually. Yeah. We couldn't understand the things that uh, God had for us, and no man can without the Spirit of God, as I preached this morning. And so without the Spirit of God, we were dead in trespasses and sins. Ephesians chapter 2. And ye who were dead in trespasses and sins. Without Christ in your heart, you do not understand why you're here. What your purpose is. What love is. What peace is. What joy is. You have glimpses of those things because God has placed those things so that people might search Him out. God's goodness is all around. So that people might happily seek Him, the Bible says. He's given life and breath and our substance and everything to all men. He's not very far from any of us. But yet... Because the natural man is without the Spirit of God, he cannot understand a thing. He's like a dead man. He's a dead man. All he knows is the natural world. And we know that the natural world is spiraling out of control. It's not getting better. It's getting worse. Now praise God in this country, we have had different times of great peace and joy. But it's not because we're anything good. If, it, if we've had any joy and peace and, 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 and comfort in, in, in this country, it's been because of the faith that people have in the Lord Jesus Christ yeah. and the stand upon His Word. But this world, we can see in our own country how it's just spiraled. Downward and downward and downward. And things are becoming worse and worse. Why? Because that's all the natural man has. Is the things of nature. And we know that all those things are going to pass away. Look at Hebrews chapter 2. The Old Testament and Ecclesiastes talks, and some in Psalms and, and some in Job, talks about that man who, who is without the Spirit of God. That he's like an animal. And really, the longer people go without God and without the Gospel and without the truth of God's Word, the more and more that they act like animals. <laughs> really. I was reading yesterday morning and uh, 
in, I think, 2 Kings. And how it was just one king after another that was doing all these abominable things. Who would take their sons and pass them through the fire unto Moloch. You say, how can people get to a point where they would take their own children and burn them to a false god in a fire? But yet that's what happens. The farther you get away from God, the more primal and, and, and the more evil that you become. And the more uh, uh, your conscience becomes seared. You think about all the destruction that is in the world. You think about someone uh, uh, such as the Nazis who, who killed millions of people. They had places, death camps set up where they would just bring in people by the thousands a day and put them in gas chambers. And they would lie to them and say, oh, we're, your, your life here is going to be great. We're going to give you everything you need and you're going to live a good life. But, you know, we've had problems with disease in some of these camps. So first things first, you're going to take a bath. And they would strip the people down naked and then they would put them uh, by the hundreds in these chambers and then gas them all. And then after the gas would leave, they'd come in and take their dead corpses out and throw them in a ditch and burn them. And you say, how could people just be that way? Because they were atheists. They did not believe in God. They believed in natural selection. That the, the strongest survive. Well, that's totally opposite of what the Bible says. Amen. Paul said, I praise God in my weakness. In my infirmities, and in my necessities, because when I am weak, then I am strong. Amen. Because then I rely upon Jesus. Yes. And you say, how could man be able to do that? Any man is capable of the worst atrocities when they get away from God. Right. And all they are are natural beasts. Right. And they corrupt themselves in those things. And we say that we deserve heaven. No one deserves heaven. That's right. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 9 says, But we see Jesus. Amen. This is one of my favorite verses right here. But we see Jesus. Aren't you glad you saw Jesus? Amen. I tell you what, the song that the girls sing, Jesus passed by. My way. <laughs> I'm glad Jesus passed by my way. Amen. And He made me whole that day. Amen. Amen. Just a sinner was I. No good. And I'm still no good. But praise the Lord, He saved me. Amen. And He made me whole. And He did something with me that could never have happened. I'm a miracle. Amen. Because I would not be here right now serving the Lord and doing anything good if it hadn't been for Jesus. Amen. Verse 9, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels. Jesus, the Creator. There was nothing created that was not created by Jesus Christ. Yet He was made lower than the angels. For what? The suffering of death. God was made lower than the angels for the suffering of death. Crowned with glory and honor. He that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. For who? For every man. Yeah. Well, that blows Calvinism out of the water. Every man. <laughs> he tasted death for every man. For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Yeah. For both he that sanctifieth 
And they who are sanctified are all of one. What love. I mean, we're a race of evil. Evil thoughts and evil actions. <coughs> Hate. I mean, if you don't believe it, just turn on the news. Such evil in the world. And yet, he died for every man, woman, and child. For which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Yeah. Not only did he die for us, but now he calls us brethren. Man, if you don't feel unworthy, <laughs> there's something wrong. You're not really taking a good look at yourself. But yet he calls us brethren. I know I'm not worthy of it. Saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. And again I will put my trust in him. And again behold I and the children which God hath given me. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood. You know, some people would ask, if God knew before He created that there would be some people who would not believe and would, would go to hell, then why did He create us? That's a good question, amen? <laughs> why would He create us if He knew there were going to be people who would not believe and would go to hell? Why? Because of love. It's not a matter of hate. Right. It's not because of those that wouldn't believe. It's because of those who would believe. Right. That's the measure of His love. Right. Yeah. It's like a mother. If a mother knew that she would have to go through three or four uh, losing children before she had one that she actually delivered, would she still do that? I believe yes. I mean, me and Angela lost one on our, our first pregnancy. But you know what? We wanted children. And that one loss of life, and you can say, oh, but it, you know, people try to call it a fetus so it, you know, it, so it doesn't tug at your heartstrings. You know, they'll call something a fetus so it doesn't sound so, you know, bad about aborting it. No, that was a baby, a living soul. That was a... But you know what? It didn't cause us to stop. What about that giving birth? <laughs> Once a woman's gone through that, she knows what it's like, but does that keep her from having, wanting to have more children? No. <laughs> And God knowing all the evil in the world and all the people that would commit the atrocities that we've seen over thousands of years. And I'm talking, there's been a lot of evil. Yet God loved so much. He saw those who would believe and trust in Him and He created. Yeah. And you know what? Love is the greatest thing that we have. Amen? Amen. Love is the greatest thing that we have in this world. It's the greatest. The most important thing. And love has to come from a place of allowing things. Freedom. Because without freedom, it's not love. If God controlled everything that we did, it's not love. Because you can make people do what you want them to do, but that doesn't mean that they, the love is returned. But yet Christ loved us before we had ever known Him. Before we had ever been born into this world, He loved us and He sent 
His Son to die for our sins. Verse 14 says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, He also Himself likewise took part of the same. He's not a distant God. It's not that He is not acquainted with our griefs and our temptations. He acquainted Himself with our griefs. He acquainted our, Himself with our sufferings and our temptations. The Bible says He was tempted like as we are, Amen. yet without sin. He knows what it's like. It's not like He just created us and said it's all up to you. No, He acquainted Himself yeah. and took upon flesh that through death He might destroy Him that had power over death, that is to say the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject unto bondage. For verily He took not on Him the nature of angels, but He took on Him the seed of Abraham. You see, people are looking for some Savior that is apart from us. Right? I, you know, there's people who believe... I mean, if you have to believe that, that we were created, that there is intelligent design, which is getting harder and harder by each discovery that's made to uh, disclaim and to prove that there isn't intelligent design because there's just so much overwhelming evidence that this world and we and... The universe was created and designed. I mean, there's, there's just too much order. You can't get that much order out of chaos. Doesn't have happen. But yet, instead of believing in God, they'll say, well, it must have been aliens. Some superior alien race seated us here. And there's some people believe that there's going to be an alien person who comes back and, and solves all the wrongdoings. I mean, you see it in the movies and the TV shows. There's always some alien coming back. I mean, World of, world of world, Worlds, was that where an alien came back and warned the earth that, hey, you know, y'all are destroying the earth and y'all better straighten up or it's, you know, going to fall apart. They're looking for that outside. No, God became man <laughs> and acquainted Himself in the flesh. He didn't take on the nature of angels. But I'm going to tell you what, there's going to come in the nature of angels. The Antichrist. And they'll follow Him. But He took on Him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore, in all things it behooved Him to be made like unto His brethren, that He might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God. To make reconciliation for the sins of the people. Amen. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. Amen. Because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And he died for all. Amen. He didn't just die for a select few. He died for every person ever born. All the way from the beginning to the end. Wow. And then he says, For the love of Christ constraineth us. Because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. We were all dead. We had no hope. There was nothing for us to hope in. You know, politics has become something that people... You know, they started out maybe thinking it'd be the answer. And people, you know, want it to be the answer, but it never is going to be the answer. Politics will never solve anything in this world. And people look, well, you know, we, we've just got the wrong type of government. You know, we've got... And my mind's not working. What kind of... Nation is this? Huh? It's a democracy, but 
but that's not what the word I'm looking for. Not socialist, but huh? Yeah, republic. Capitalism. Thank you. We have a capitalist system. Uh, system. And people call, talk about crony capitalism. And, uh, but capitalism, you know, what it was meant to be was a free market where anybody could work their way up from the bottom with hard work and effort and make the American dream. But now they're saying, well, capitalism is all wrong. We need socialism. You know, it's not hard work that's going to get you anything. It's taking from the rich and, 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 and making everything even and some utopian that we can live in where everybody has everything and we all have the same thing. That's never going to happen. And even in the places where they've tried to make it work, it's never worked. Why? Because men are evil. There are always going to be those who want to seize the power and reign over those others. We've seen it time and time again with Hitler, with Mao, with, I mean, you name them. Oh, they were supposed to be utopian societies. Well, that's not the answer either. And I'm not saying capitalism is the answer. I'm saying Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the answer. But yet they look for all the answers and all these different things and nothing is working. Because it's man who is the problem. They've got one thing wrong, right. <laughs> They've got one thing right. Man is the problem. But you know what? Man's never going to be able to solve man's problem. It's going to come from God. Amen. And guess what? It did come from God. And that love of Christ that He has for us, that love that, that sent Him to the cross. You know, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, He says, If in this life we have hope, in this life only we... Man, I cannot talk tonight. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. You know, if Christ is just something that we toy around with, don't really mean anything. Well, you know, we take a little bit of Christ and some of His teachings and we take a little bit of Buddha. We take a little bit of Hinduism. We take a little bit of Muhammad. And let's just mix it all together. And now we have this New Age religion. Where it's just like everything mixed together. That's what's, that's what's coming down the pike right now. Is this New Age religion. Well, how miserable is that? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh, up, cometh unto the Father but by me. It's only through Jesus Christ... And only can be through Jesus Christ because He's the one who put His money where His mouth was. And said, I love, therefore I am going to give my life for all. He's the only one who cared. He's the only one who showed that type of love. No one else cares for you like Jesus. Yeah. Amen. There is not anyone Children, listen up. There is no one who loves you more than Jesus. Amen. Now your mama loves you. All you children, your mamas, your grandparents, your daddies, they love you. But not like Jesus. Because Jesus saw all your sins, everything you would do wrong. He knows everything about you. And He still loved you and gave His life for you on the cross. Amen. So that you might have eternal life. Yeah. So that you can have hope. Not just to be hopeless. But to have something to live for. A purpose in your life. Romans 
chapter 2 and verse 3 and 4 says, And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? You know what spankings does for, for uh, kids? I want to get the kids' attention now, if, you're, if you can pay attention. Nobody likes spankings, right? Rosie, you like spankings? But you've gotten some, haven't you? When you've disobeyed and done something you weren't supposed to, right? You know what that teaches you? That there's judgment. There's justice in the world. You can't just do what you want to do and get away with it. There's payment to be made. It's not just children. You can go to any jailhouse you want to and you're going to see people who have made the wrong choices and have disobeyed the laws of the land. And guess what happened? The police came and picked them up and handcuffed them and took them to jail. And then they had to go before a judge. And the judge judged righteously that they had committed a crime and put them in jail. Now a jailhouse is not a place you want to be. But there is a law that goes with that. That with your choices you make, there comes consequences. Yeah. Now, we nobody likes spankings. And I had my, I didn't, maybe not, not as many as my brothers did, but I, I had plenty growing up getting spankings. <laughs> my dad, he had a paddle made out of pine and had his name carved right in it. And uh, he wasn't afraid of, of getting after it when I needed it. But you know what that taught me? It taught me that you know what? If I make wrong choices, there is a payment to be made. Amen. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judges them which do such things? We know what wrong is. Right? Even little children know what right and wrong is. You can look at someone else and when they do something wrong, you can say, ooh, they're in trouble. Mm, I'm telling mama. Right? You know what right and wrong is. But you who looks at your brother or sister or friend and says, Ooh, you're doing something wrong. You're going to get in trouble. You see, you've condemned yourself because you do the same things that they do. Talking back, not cleaning your room when you're supposed to. All these things that there are rules and you break them, guess what? There's a consequence. And don't think when you get in trouble that it's mama's fault. Mama's just being too hard. She just don't understand. No, it's because you broke the rules. And guess what? Do we think even as adults, that we will escape the judgment of God, that we can just live how we want to live, and there will not be a judgment, that there won't be payment? Or despisest thou the riches of His goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? Now you see there's hope, isn't there? There's not just judgment, but there's grace and there's mercy. Now kids, you know what mercy is? Mercy is when you deserve punishment, but you don't get it. Amen? Amen. Mercy is when you deserve to be punished, but yet they don't give it to you. 
And grace is when you don't deserve anything good. When you've been bad and you don't deserve a thing good. And you're, but you're really sorry, okay? You really feel bad about it. But you don't deserve anything good, but yet they give you something good anyway. That's grace. And you see, God's mercy is that we deserve hell because we're sinners. We deserve to go down to a devil's hell in flames and fire and burn. Yes. But God had mercy. And that mercy was that He sent Jesus to die for us. To take our punishment that we deserve and take it upon Himself. Now, what, what would happen if one of you kids were in trouble and you had done something wrong and you knew you were going to get a spanking? And just about the time your mom goes to give you that spanking, your brother comes in there or your sister and says, no, I'll take the spanking. Let me take the spanking. For him. I'll take his spanking. You see, that's what Jesus did for us. We deserve to die and go to hell, but Jesus said, no, I'll take their place. I'll die for them. I'll take their sins upon me. And I'll pay the cost. And that's what He did for every man, for every woman, and for every child. So see, it's the goodness of God. And not only did He take your punishment, but then He gave you the power to become His children. Amen? He says, not only am I going to pay your, your, your penalty, your punishment, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm going to pay for it myself, but now I'm going to give you what you don't even deserve, and that is my blessings, my joy, and inheritance. You're going to get everything that Jesus Christ deserves, which is glory and honor and blessing. You're going to get it because of His grace. So He loves you. So see, it's the love of God that leads us to repentance. Knowing that He took upon Himself our punishment and then gave us such wonderful <coughs> blessings, spiritual blessings, heavenly blessings, that now we don't have to worry about death. Because if I have repented of my sins, if I've been sorrowful for my sins and I've asked God to forgive me and I've asked Jesus to come into my heart that now I know that I have a home in heaven that I don't have to go to hell. Right. That I can go to heaven and now I am going to live with Jesus in heaven when I die for all of eternity. It's that love that constrains us. That love that He had for us that keeps us wanting to live for Him and to please Him and to do His commandments. Yeah. Even in the face of adversity and persecution and all the things, hatred that might come our way because we're standing for Jesus, we want to do it because He did it for us. He faced the, the hateful crowds. They spit in His face. They plucked His beard. They slapped Him. They had a game where they would, the Roman soldiers put something over His face where He couldn't see and then they would slap Him and ask Him who did it. They'd slap Him as hard as they could and then take the blindfold off and say, Okay, Jesus, which one of us slapped you? And then they beat him with a whip until his bones was showing on his back. And then they took a wooden cross and he had to carry it up a hill that they were going to nail him to that cross and crucify him. 
And he did it all for you and for me. Right. He faced the angry crowds. He faced death. And the persecution, he faced it all so that we might have life. Look at 1 John chapter 3 and verse 16. I like verses like this because you go from John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. And then you come to 1 John chapter 3 and verse 16 and look what it says. Hereby perceive we the love of God because He laid down His life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Yeah. Isn't that good? You go from John 3, so I don't think that's coincidence, amen? Right. I think God had it all in, in His plan, amen. amen? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son to, who, uh, to hereby perceive, hereby we perceive the love of God because He laid down His life for us. How do you know God loves you? Because He died for you. Yeah. Yeah. Amen? Right. Don't ever question whether God loves you or not. Because you know He died for you. Yeah. Yeah. And if He died for you, let's look at Romans chapter 8. Amen? I love this verse of Scripture over in Romans chapter 8. Because it brings so much comfort and joy to, to think upon and I want you to think upon, uh, upon this. In verse 31 he says, What shall we then say to these things? What's our response to the love that Christ has for us? If He loved us so much that He died for us, what can we say to these things? And He says, If God be for us, who can be against us? Amen. Amen. Amen? Listen, if God loved you so much, don't worry about what people think. Don't worry about what Satan is doing. Because if God is for you, and how do you know He's for you? Because He died for you. So that you can live with Him forever. Now, if He loved you and died for you, if He is for us, who can be against us? Right. Amen. Amen. If you go down uh, to verse 35, He says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Nothing. Amen. Yeah, Nothing. His love goes beyond anything because He already knew it all. Yeah. Right? You're not going to surprise God. There's nothing you can say or think or do that's going to surprise Him. He knew it all before the beginning. Yeah. But yet He loved you anyway. And He died for you. So if God be for us, who can be against us? Verse 32, He that spared not His own Son, meaning He sent His Son to die for us, yeah. but delivered Him up for us all, how shall He not with Him also freely give us all things? Right. Do we have to pay for our salvation? Nope. It's free. Jesus went and died for us and we didn't have to pay for anything. Right. Amen. Amen? There's not one thing we had to do to earn. We just had to believe it and accept it. And so if He delivered His own Son, Jesus, on the cross for us all, how shall He not with Him freely give us all things? Man, what a powerful thought. Amen. We don't deserve anything, but that's the love that God has for us. That's the love of God that constrains us. Knowing that we don't deserve one red cent. But yet, He gave it to us anyway. And more than that. Amen? I mean, if someone's willing to die for you, right? Why would they not be willing to do anything else? I told Angel <laughs> when we were dating... 
<laughs> she's laughing because I still give her a hard time for this. And I tell her I never was hungry with her until she said this. Of course, she'll say different, but I told her one time when we were out, and I said, you know, I love you so much, I died for you. And she started giggling. And I thought, what is she laughing about? I was serious. I, I was dead serious. I'm like, what are you laughing about? And she's like, I can't tell you. I was like, oh, you have to now. You know, I'm not going to leave this alone until you tell me. And so she started laughing. She said, well, in her mind, she thought, and she said, prove it. I died for you, we'll prove it. You know? And I'm like, oh, it's on now. No more Mr. Nice Guy anymore. If that's how it's going, we're, we're going to go with the punches. But really, if, I, if I'm willing to die for her, and I'm putting my foot in my own, I'm, you know, I'm, I, I'm putting myself on the cross here. <laughs> I'm willing to die for her. If I love her so much, what else would I not be willing to do? That's right. And ouch, that hurts. I'm going to go to the altar right now and pray. <laughs> yeah. Amen. Amen. Because when we first got married, I said, I'll do anything but wash dishes. <laughs> I'll die for you, but I ain't doing no dishes. <laughs> now, honey, I ain't Jesus. <laughs> and I'm not God. <laughs> He's working on me, though. <laughs> you see, you think I'm just up here preaching to you. I'm preaching to myself. Amen? Alright, Lord. But listen, if He loved us so much that He's willing to die for us and did die for us, why would He withhold anything? He wouldn't. But we have to trust Him. And understand that it's that love that constrains us. Not trying to earn that love. We already have that love. We're not trying to earn God's love. Yeah. Listen, if you think you have to come to church and do all these things so that God will love you, you're wasting your time. Yeah. He already loves you. That's yeah. right. He loved you enough that He died for you. You don't have to earn it. Just accept it. That's right. Yeah. And then thank God for it. Because yeah. I'm going to tell you what, it's going to humble you to understand that you don't have to do anything to earn His love, that He loves you. And now that love is going to constrain you. It's going to arrest you. Amen. <laughs> and you're going to be saying, man, I want to serve the Lord. Yeah. I want to give all that I am for Him. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1. And we'll close with this verse. 1 Peter chapter 1, and verse, starting in verse 17, if you will stand with me. He says here in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 17, And if ye call on the Father, who without respect of persons judgeth according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things, such as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God, that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God. Amen. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit and the unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. Amen. As Jesus has loved us, amen, as we read in 1 John, we need to lay our lives down for the brethren to love each other, amen. amen. Verse 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Amen. 
For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word by which the gospel is preached unto you. Amen. All the glory of man and all fleshly things are going to pass away. But what you do for the Lord, that's what's going to matter. Amen. And it's His love that constrains us. Not trying to earn His love, but serving Him because He already has given us His love. Right. Amen. Lord, we thank You tonight for Your love and Your mercy. Lord, we just pray that You would help us to love You more. Lord, to give ourselves to You more. And Lord, to be a willing servant for Christ. Lord, a willing prisoner, giving our life to You for Your honor and for Your glory. Lord, that we might truly, sincerely, with our whole hearts, serve You to please You. Lord, because we know You've given us everything and haven't attached anything to it. Lord, You loved us freely and You've given that freely to us. Lord, thank You for the salvation that we have in Jesus. Amen. And the forgiveness of sins because of His shed blood for Amen. us. Amen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated as we sing. The altar is open for those who want to pray. Page 30. Page 30. We'll sing all four verses of nothing but the blood. Page 30.
are not worthy of him dying on the cross for us, but we thank you that God, he loved us enough to be yes. that you loved enough us enough to create us, yes. even though you knew there'd be some that would not receive Christ as Savior. Yes. Lord, we just pray that you would help us then to share that gospel with everybody that would listen. Lord, this world is full of people that do not believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And God, may we ever be mindful to share the gospel Amen. to as many as we'll receive. Yes. Lord, we ask now that you'd forgive us for we've failed. You bless your God. And those that heal and those that have not, you know our needs, dear Father. We depend upon you. Our faith is totally in you and not in man. Yes. And we know, dear God, that you will do what is necessary for us. Yes. We also know, dear Father, that uh, God, you uh, have told your people that they will humble themselves and pray and seek your face and turn from their wicked ways that you would hear from heaven. And God, that you would heal our land. And you know that this land called America needs healing. And Lord, we just pray, God, that that healing comes from your people that yes. will pray and stand in the gap. And God, that we would be fervent in our prayers. Amen. And dear God, that we would pray for our nation and for our government as well. Yes. Forgive us, Father, for we tell you again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.